Today is May 4th, 2018. I'm here today with uh, Lisa Bruce in the Cumberland County Historical Society. Uh, so thank you, Lisa, for, for being here. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I'll ask you is sort of how did you or your family come to live in Cumberland County? Um, my grandmother on my father's side was born in Walnut Bottom and eventually moved to Carlisle with her mother. My grandfather on my father's side was an immigrant from Germany, and she met him at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. He was a beautician there, and she was working in the, as a receptionist to beauty, at the beauty parlor. Mm -hmm. And they um, had one child while they were in New York City, and luckily pulled their money out of the market right before the crash and decided to move to Carlisle and open a beauty shop. Hmm. My grandparents on the other side, my grandmother was from Perry County someplace. Um, my grandfather was also from Perry County. Um, his father was an Irish immigrant and his father actually started the phone company in Perry County. Wow. With the help of his four sons and daughter. They ran the whole thing and installed the whole thing. Wow. <laughs> and they with his phone company work, he eventually ended up in Carlisle as well. Okay. So, did you grow up in Carlisle? I did. Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what did uh, your parents do? Um, my dad was an upholster. He had his mm -hmm. own shop. Um, for a time, he worked at the state, at the Capitol building, upholstering things there. And for a time he also worked at what's now Camp Hill State Prison, but at that point was a juvenile facility called White Hill, and he taught upholstery in there. But most of my life he had a shop in our, at the end of our yard. Okay. Uh, what, what were your parents' names? Jim and Pat Schmaus. And so you mentioned that uh, you grew up in Carlisle. Mm -hmm. what, what was Carlisle like when you were growing up? It was great. You could as a kid, you could just wander the streets. You could ride your bike out in the country. It was totally safe. Um, I'd walk up to the library. I'd walk up to the stores uptown. I'd pay bills for my mom. I can't imagine giving my 10-year-old kid money to go pay the electric bill right now and walk uptown to do it. <laughs> um, we had a lot of freedom. You know, We'd ride our bikes wherever we wanted, went to the pool every day in the summer. What area in town did you live in? I lived on East High Street, um, okay. right down from the First Lutheran Church. Hmm. And it's it's a log cabin underneath the siding. It was built in the 1700s. Uh -huh. That's where I grew up. And then uh, what, what schools did you attend? As I went to Latour Elementary for kindergarten. And then I went to St. Patrick's, which was at that point on Pomford Street hmm. for first through eighth grade. And then I went to Carla High School. Were any sort of memories that, that stand out to you in, about those school years, or? No. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I mean, just sort of typical school. Go to school, have friends, play, sure. come home, <laughs> do no. homework, play. <laughs> um, what was the, what was St. Patrick's like on Pomfret Street, like the building and? Um. It was very crowded. When I was in first and second grade, and I think fourth grade, the classrooms were in the back of what was Catherine Drexel Hall, which is now like where the priests live. Um, and we had 60 kids in our first and second grade classes. Wow. I don't know how they did it. Of course, we were all scared to death and sure. would behave no matter what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and St. Patrick, I remember... Um, at that time, for most of that time, Mass was still in Latin. So I was in the choir, and we sang all Gregorian chant, and we sang at every funeral. I, I don't know how we learned it, because we were always over at the church <laughs> singing songs at a funeral. Hmm. 
And I'm guessing that, that that's no longer the case, probably. Well, it's not in Latin anymore, and they don't do Gregorian chant. Yeah. But I still actually am in the choir and sing. Okay. And play, so. But, but are there still kids attending every funeral? And... Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Now, if the funeral is at the new church out on Marsh Drive, mm -hmm. so they'll pull altar, altar servers from the school to assist. Yeah, okay. But no, the kids don't ever go to a funeral. <laughs> So, what did you end up doing after uh, you graduated from high school? Um, I went to Slippery Rock State College, which is now Slippery Rock University, and I double majored in special ed and elementary education. And did you end up going into education? Then? I did. My first job that I accepted was sort of on a crazy whim. I went to New Orleans to teach. Oh, wow. <laughs> they are so desperate in New Orleans for teachers that they will go all over the country and talk people who don't know any better to come in there. <laughs> well, how long did you uh, stay in New Orleans? Fifteen then? years. Wow. I met my husband, had four kids, but the deal was I was gonna, we could stay until he could retire with a partial retirement and we were moving north of the Mason-Dixon line <laughs> for the kids' sake. Yeah. Uh, well, then you ended up uh, back in Carlisle. I, yeah, I mean, we weren't necessarily looking to end up back in Carlisle, but it just so happened I was offered a job at Big Spring School District, and he was offered a job in West Perry, so we moved to Carlisle. <laughs> and did you teach special ed in both New Orleans and Big Spring? Um, or? Yeah, most of it was special ed. I did teach some elementary in the New Orleans area, and I was an administrator for a while there as well. But when we came back here, I taught at Big Spring for a year, and then went to Carla High School and taught special ed until I retired. Okay. And then, uh, so your husband was also a teacher then? He well, he was an administrator at that point. So okay. he started in West Perry, um, stayed there three years, and then moved to the Carla School District and retired from there. Hmm. So you, you both ended up at the Carla. Yeah. What was that experience like? Or Well, it was kind of weird to go back and teach at the same school that you had attended. Yeah. And a lot of the teachers were still there, even though it was, had been a while, in my opinion. Sure. But it was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Had the building changed a lot, or was um, it still...? At that point, it hadn't, but while I taught there, it really changed a lot. They added that middle part. Um, where the Votac and stuff is, okay. and the library, and then built that bridge across. Because when I was in high school, your classes were either in Swartz or the other building. Mm -hmm. Hardly ever did anybody go back and forth. And now, like it's constant, you're back and forth all day long, those kids. Mm. <laughs> so it, did it used to be like you had sort of like different tracks were in different buildings or? Well, it wasn't really tracks, it was like 9th and 10th grade were in one building okay. and 11th and 12th were in the other and and Votech was sort of in the middle. <laughs> now they have... It's sort of all mixed up, yeah. Okay. Like by subject or is... Well, it's still somewhat by grade. Mm. Like the major subjects like English or math, the 9th and 10th grade kids would pretty much stay in Swartz unless they were really advanced taking a higher level course and then they're back and forth. Yeah. So what year did you end up moving back to Carlisle? 1990. Okay. Yeah, so it's been a while. So I was going to say, you, so you also just missed all the uh, state championships. I know, the basketball, the basketball team. championships, yeah. Well, I watched it from afar, but... Did you? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, so your husband also, you said, was an administrator at mm -hmm. Carlisle? Yeah. So... Um, was he an administrator when you were a teacher, or did he become an administrator after you um, retired? No, he was an administrator while I was a teacher. He's, when he first came to Carlisle from West Perry, he was at Wilson Middle School. Mm. And then after a few years, they moved him to the high school on where I was. And they sort of made a deal that, like, he wouldn't observe my, you know, oh. evaluate my work or anything. That'd be <laughs> sort of weird. <laughs> yeah. But really, I never saw him. Because I'm back in my little room doing my thing, and he's up in his office doing his thing. Mm. And then did he stay on after you retired? Or? No, he actually retired before I did. Did he? Yeah. Okay.
Did you did you do uh, support him in any way too, or like um, I was told that you were att you attended a lot of things or uh, or events, maybe. Um, well, I'm pretty busy. I do lots of stuff. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, not really him so much. I mean, when he was, when we were in Louisiana and he was coaching, I was very supportive of that. Went to all this stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. But. But then when you came back to Carlisle, you yeah, found other things to I was occupy kind your time. Of, I mean, I, we had four kids. Yeah. You know, I had a full-time job. I do a lot of volunteer stuff, so we sort of just. Sure. No, no, do I, whatever. <laughs> you know, I was. <laughs> yeah. Um, did your kids attend the Carlisle school? They did, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, was that, was that, you mentioned that was one of the reasons why you moved back? Well, for a better education system, yes. Yeah. So definitely, yeah. Um, so did you, did you ever have your kids in your classes or? No, because I taught learning support and okay. they didn't need learning support. Sure. <laughs> But it, I think they found it quite handy for me to be there because if they yeah. forgot to get something signed or needed money, or whatever, you were an right excuse. The there yeah. I was. They could just stop. <laughs> but at the same time, they you probably were a little bit more strict about having them attend school then. Oh, well, I would have been anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And were they actively involved in extracurricular? They were. Um, the oldest played golf in high school. He played soccer in middle school, I think. Um, the other three um, all did track, mm. um, and my second child, Matt, um, was a pole vaulter in track and was a diver on the swim team. And I have twins, the youngest ones, they did cross country and track as well. So for a lot of years, and they did it in college too, so for a lot of years all we did was go to track meets and swim meets. and. Particularly once they got to college, because it's all over the East Coast. Yeah. You know, you're driving up to Boston and driving to Ohio someplace or Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> now, were they on those, like, 2004 cross-country teams, or...? Um, no, they would have been the year before, because the Twins graduated in 2004, so they would have been on the 2003 team. Okay. Yeah. Because I heard those teams did very well. They did very, very well, yeah. yes. And they and both boys got scholarships to run wow. in college. And the pole vaulter had a scholarship to pole vault in college. Wow. Ended up Big East champion. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, are, are you and your husband athletic? Well, you said he coached, but... Well, he coached. He was a runner in high school and college. Okay. I'm not really. I hike a lot. <laughs> walk a lot, but no. <laughs> I was never in an organized sport or intramural stuff, but not. Yeah. Hmm. Nothing real exciting. So was that kind of an introduction to you, or had you already been sort of introduced to it by attending you know, well, I had, the events in New Orleans? Yeah, I had. I mean, and even in high school, I had friends that did things, so I'd go watch and stuff, yeah. And I wanted my kids. I told them they had to do something in high school. Mm. I didn't really care what it was. They could pick, but I think kids that do something yeah. are busy. They meet friends. They're too tired to get into much trouble. <laughs> and I actually talked the second one into pole vaulting. Really? Because he was a real sort of risk taker kind of kid. And I thought it would be like supervised, organized risk taking as opposed yeah. to just doing stupid stuff on his own. <laughs> well, it worked out very well for him. Yeah. Well, during, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that the, the job, too, was very different from New Orleans and to Big Spring and uh -huh. Carlisle, even. Well, inner city New Orleans is quite different from Carlisle. Sure. <laughs> and um, the first month or two I was teaching there, I was in, I mean, a horrendous school. There's no other way to put it. They had no supplies. 75% mm -hmm. of the windows were broken out, wires hanging out of the walls. And um, so one day, a bunch of people climbed in the window. We were on the ground floor with a gun. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. They didn't really cover this in teaching of <laughs> reading that slippery rock. Yeah. <laughs> but luckily, my students sort of surrounded me, and we just walked out. We laughed, and they laughed. And I said to the principal afterwards, I said, you know, what? 
should you do? <laughs> and he's like, oh, we'll send them to the office. I'm like, oh yeah, right, idiot. <laughs> but there was no intercom system. There was no way to, no phone, no intercom. Hmm. Down in the basement all by myself. But luckily nothing bad happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and did the, the things that you have to do change over time too in terms of... I guess maybe the support or how, how oh, you went about it. Yeah, when I first student taught, there was no such thing as an IEP, which is an individual oh, yeah. education plan. We just taught, and somehow people learned. And when I was finishing teaching, I mean, we're writing 60 and 70 pages of individual education plan uh -huh. that takes away from time devoted to kids. Mm -hmm. And we were also teaching to the test because they wanted them all to take, you know, the state test, even though, I mean, they couldn't possibly pass it. Like, the, the high school test is based on the idea that you've probably finished Algebra two, mm. And when you're working at a third grade level on math, say, because you're in learning support, well, <laughs> it might as well be written in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> so that was quite mm. frustrating <laughs> no, yeah. for everybody involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and too, I'm sure that, you know, they tried to track all, like, how well your students were doing. Right, too. yeah. And I mean, and one time, one of the administrative persons came in, I won't name her, but she said, I don't understand why they're not reading on grade level. I'm like, well, first of all, they're intellectually challenged, and second of all, we haven't even taught them reading since they were in the fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> so, how could they possibly read on grade level? So, yeah. It's quite frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So I imagine the t uh, teaching in that field, you know, requires special skills or maybe just, you know, a certain type of mindset yeah. maybe in terms of... It does. Uh, most people burn out very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. They don't last long at all. But I don't know. I guess I was just sort of patient and found them interesting and fun and particularly at the high school level because they're I mean they're young adults no matter yep. what their intellectual abilities are so they're kind of fun to talk to and hang out with and you know whatever mm. yeah I imagine that must be tough for them too you know constantly having new new teachers right and, yeah you yeah. know because all, all that change right yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> Well, so after, you, you mentioned that after you retired, or maybe even while you were working, you became very involved in the, the community and I did. Well, actually, volunteer. while I was still working, I yeah. was pretty involved in the community. Well, a little more so after I retired, because well, I had more time. Well, it makes sense. <laughs> what, what were some of the things that you ended up doing? Um, I volunteered with the Red Cross. I actually started a Red Cross club at the high school. Hmm. Um, and got involved in doing disaster response locally while I was still working, you know, going out to fires and floods and helping people. Um, I do preparedness talks for them, talking to people about how to prepare for a disaster, what you should have. Um, I started going to national disasters, um, which I could do once I retired. Just can't just leave work for three weeks. They yeah. take a dim view of that. <laughs> um, right now, I do a lot of casework for them. After people have had a fire or a flood or something, and somebody's gone out and initially helped them, I follow up with them, mostly over the phone, um, referring them to other agencies if they needed, helping them figure out what to do next, etc. Mm. Yeah. Um, are there any particular, you know, cases or, you know, fires maybe locally that really mm -hmm. stand out to you? Um, yeah, I, ha I responded to the Blondies fire, mm. um, which was like 12 or 13 units of apartments. Um, in the middle of the night, it was freezing cold out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also did the one on High Street, kind of across from the old jail mm. and that was another 12 or 13 unit place um, nationally the thing I remembered the most was 
I was in Mississippi for tornadoes, and um, we had gone and done this little tiny town in the Delta region, and I said to my partner before we left, I said, before we leave, maybe we should check with like the mayor or the police chiefs to make sure we got everybody, because I don't want to drive back here 120 miles tomorrow again for nothing. And um, so we did, and he, um, he said, yeah, there's this one guy, he said, but you'll never find it. I'll take you there. So we hop in the guy's truck and we're driving out and who knows where we even are. He said, now before we get there, I just want to know, you to know, he's alive. He's okay. This poor guy had lived in a trailer, heard the tornado sirens, went to the hallway of the trailer, which is not much better than yep. being anywhere else. The entire trailer lifted 20 feet in the air, mm -hmm. came down in a pile of rubble with him underneath of it. He got his cell phone out of his pocket and called for help. But the bottom of the trailer, which is a big piece of metal, was wrapped around a pine tree like this. It was, we were just stood there looking at it like, oh. <laughs> when you go nationally on disasters, um, well, even locally too, the people are just so appreciative of your help. It's, mm -hmm. it's so nice, yeah. And the people at nationals, when they bring a lot of people in from all over the country to help with something really big, they're just kind of a fun crowd to hang out with. They're all interesting. Yeah. On that particular trip, there was a couple that was in their 80s and were still doing it. They had started in World War II when they were in high school helping yeah. the Red Cross <laughs> and still could help. So, kind of fun. Now, uh, you mentioned, you know, the, the blondies and the high street mm -hmm. fires. Yeah. Is a lot of that, I mean, are you kind of, like, notified as soon as the fire is out or even while the Yeah, we're is? notified as soon as the fire chief determines that they can't stay there. Okay. He asks them, do they have any place to stay? And if the answer is no, we're called. Hmm. So, so we don't often get the call right away. Because okay. some, I mean, there are some people, you know, they have insurance. They don't need the Red Cross. They mm -hmm. can do it or for Or family that's local. Right, or, or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then you mentioned nowadays most of the work that you're doing is sort of following up. So is that a lot of referring? Yeah, referring to other agencies that might could help them. Because we are limited, the Red Cross is limited by National Red Cross mm -hmm. into what we can do for people. You know, we're allowed X dollars for food and clothing, X dollars for lodging. I can extend it a little bit sometimes, but after that, I need to just refer them to partner agencies that could maybe help them. Salvation Army, New Digs, veterans if they're a veteran, mm -hmm. stuff like that, yeah. But I imagine most people, you know, are even if they lived in the area for a long time, probably don't know the specific places to Right, yeah. To they ask, don't. So. Right, yeah. And they and a lot of these agencies require a written referral. Okay. Because, you know, anybody could go in and say, Oh, I had this or that and mm -hmm. who know I mean, sad to say, people make it up sometimes. So you're able to provide that yeah. written mm -hmm. referral. Yeah. Hmm. I mostly just listen to them. Yeah. As they muddle their way through this mess that they're in. I had one gentleman, his, there, it was a flooding situation, although his house was not flooded, the walls had, the basement walls had collapsed. Hmm. And he's like, I think I can get back in here tomorrow. I'm like, no, I, I'm not a contractor, hmm. but I'm pretty sure it's going to take a while for them to fix this. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I imagine... So I'm just trying to compose this question in my head because I'm sure it's tough to see sort of, you know, all these people kind of probably some of the worst moments of their life, but at the same time, yeah. you know, I'm sure they're, they're, most of them are probably very appreciative that, you know, Oh, they are. There. So For the vast majority of them are appreciative, yeah. It's probably, you know, conflicting, you know, in terms of it, it's terrible that you're seeing them at this mm -hmm. moment, but also, you know, that you're able to help them right. so you're providing some yeah. assistance. So yeah. I'm sure it's <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting. Not everybody does. I also am um 
in a, if we were to have a local disaster, mm -hmm. most most of the time that's flooding. Um, or if we were expecting, say, a hurricane to come through or something, um, I'm the Red Cross person that sits at the Emergency Operations Center okay. in the Red Cross Mass Care Desk and just sort of refers information back and forth. and um, So that's kind of interesting, too. Have you done that recently? or? Um, not for a real thing. Um, okay, just sort of the we, test runs? We do drill. We do like a three-mile island drill, and we do mm -hmm. random FEMA drills from time to time. So it's been a few months since I've been out to one, but um, yeah, luckily we haven't had a yeah a real thing to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I mean... There's a drill, I think there's a drill next week, but it's like a standby drill for... It said bad weather or something. I don't. I mean, okay. there's not really bad weather coming. They just pretend. Sure. And they they throw for the drills. They throw all kinds of situations at you. So it's yeah. never just oh the train wrecked and it's spilling toxic waste. Oh, and then we had this here and then this there. Yeah. <laughs> just to see how the different groups that attend this work together. And we always get. I mean, super high marks from FEMA and Pima when we do it. Because we're, hmm. I mean, it's the same people that do it, and we know each other. And we're mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, can you do this? Okay, I'll do that. You do this. Now, do you go to FEMA for trainings or are there Red Cross um, trainings? I've had a lot of Red Cross trainings. I've done some FEMA training online. Okay. And most of the Red Cross training nowadays is online, too. Hmm. They just kind of put it in your... It's called Volunteer Connection. They just stick it in your little box and say, do this. Well, yeah, I didn't know if you ever went down to Emmitsburg where, where FEMA is. No, no, I haven't been there, huh? But I've worked with FEMA people on national disasters always have FEMA people okay. there. Yeah. And a lot of times we, we do the same work. Um, one of the things they do before they do anything is assessment. So FEMA's out assessing, Red Cross is out assessing, and then we kind of just throw it all together. Hmm. Um, yeah. Well, um, a lot of what we've just talked about is dealing with things after disasters mm -hmm. have happened, but you mentioned that you oftentimes give talks about preparing yeah, for disasters. Yeah. What, what does that involve? Or? Um, well, I basically tell them a little bit about the Red Cross, what the Red Cross is able to do, um, mm -hmm. both locally and nationally. Um, and th but people really should be prepared themselves. You should be prepared at the very least to leave your house in a few minutes and be away for th at least three days mm. and have what you need. A and the same to be at least in, stuck in your house for three days, maybe without power and water, and have what you need to survive. Tr in all truth, it probably should be more than that. You should probably be able to do it for like two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. um, you know... I tell them what they should probably have in a kit to run out the door with, um, what they should have in their house if they're stuck in there for a certain period of time, et cetera. And it's interesting because when you do this talk, the people that are really old get it completely because mm. they like grew up on a farm somewhere and they probably were stuck out there for a week or two at a time when their snow was bad. Sure. And the young people are just like, well, I'm just going to call or... Yeah. No, yeah. it's it's not going to work. <laughs> and I say, you know, yes, the red, the local Red Cross can help you if it's just a few houses. If it's the whole town, like in some of those hurricanes and tornadoes, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we can't fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can bring in people from outside eventually, but for those first days, you better be able to take care of yourself. Now, when when you say you know be prepared to leave, mm -hmm. I'm just maybe for my own personal. <laughs> how how, I mean, what when you leave, or how are you expecting people to go a certain distance, or still within the area, or I mean, well, it sort of just depends um, on the situation. On the situation, um, and I'm the worst at this. You should always have a half a tank of gas in your car. Mm. Always, my mom always does that. I wait till it's on like that little light is flashing too. Because yep. I don't like putting gas in the car. Um, because if, say, the power was down, mm -hmm. 
the gas pump's not going to work either. Yeah. <laughs> and the little Mac machine's not going to work either. The ATMs. Um, I said, have half a tank of gas in your car. Have a backpack prepared with copies of your insurance papers, a list of phone numbers that you might need, because if your cell phone's not working, I don't know anybody's phone number. It's all in my phone. Yeah. I'd have to... Um, a place where you could go, maybe. Some cash. Maybe a week or so of your medication. Some clothes. If you have a baby, like diapers and formula. And mm. If you have pets, you need to... You really need to think through. If you just had five minutes to get out of the house, what are you taking? Yeah. What do you need? No, yeah, you, <laughs> I mean, it's... I had this conversation the other day. I mean, how reliant we are nowadays on technology oh, yeah. and what and happens if it goes yeah. like that. Totally. Lost. <laughs> and I always say at the preparedness time, the, the big disaster is probably going to be when the, if the national grid goes down. Yeah. And they can hack into that. We'd be lost. We would. We can't call anybody. We can't do anything. Yeah. We wouldn't know how to navigate to anywhere. <laughs> right. Nobody knows how to read a map. <laughs> And, and another thing, you should have some meeting place for your family. So say if, you know, you're at work and someone's at school and somebody else is away. Mm -hmm. If something ever happens, where are we meeting? Because um, my husband's from New Orleans and um, Katrina, their phones didn't work for each other. Mm. They left, the ones who left and got out. Their phones worked wherever they were, but they couldn't call each other at all because I guess it went through New Orleans or something. They could all call me. I could call the other one. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't, yeah. Hmm. It was a big mess. <laughs> what? So so he had family then in he did, yeah. New Orleans um, at that point? Yeah, plenty of it. Um, and my oldest son is a meteorologist, mm -hmm. and he actually called them right before, because they didn't order a mandatory evacuation till the very last minute. Mm. He said, this is it. Get out. <laughs> and they luckily, all but one of them listen. Yeah. And they luckily were far enough north that they had no power for months. Mm. But they had, they weren't flooded. Mm -hmm. um, they said they were hiding, they said they'd never do it again. They were hiding like in the master bedroom closet holding the door shut with the wind and when they would look out there were like those big pine trees that they make telephone poles of mm -hmm. going through the sky like arrows thousands of them just wow. fly everybody else had left though and six of them ended up moving up here with us for a while because their house not only was flooded to the roof but they lived in the place where the oil tank mm. spilled and so it was all coated in oil too so yeah. <laughs> Quite a mess. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, having such, I guess, maybe a direct experience, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, with your husband's family, mm -hmm. did that inform any of your thinking in terms of being involved? Well, that is why I joined the Red Cross. Um, because I had friends who stayed. Mm -hmm. um, now, they didn't flood, but they had no power. There were no grocery stores open. There was nothing... And they said the Red Cross was through there twice a day, every day, with hot food for months and months and months. And I thought, well, that seems like a pretty good thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad they were useful. And they said some other agencies were totally useless. Mm. You know, gave them, like, brochures and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, I'm sure that's what you want after <laughs> yeah. your house has been flooded. Right, I'm going to read about something. <laughs> Past the time. Yeah, but that's why I kind of got involved after that. Okay. So, so when did you retire then? Um, I think it was about six years ago. Oh okay, yeah, so 2012. I think maybe 2011. I'm not sure. All right. Yeah, no, because I was sometimes <laughs> yeah. during these conversations, you know, these timelines get a little bit yeah. confusing. So it was after. So, Katrina was. Well, Katrina was six. Was, I think. I mean, I started I started the Red Cross Club at the high school and then started doing local disaster stuff then. And yep. then, but I didn't go. I didn't start to go nationally 
until after. It's well, I don't know if I was retired or if I just could do it in the summer, which is when a mm. lot of stuff happens. Well, yeah, I'm guessing yeah. wildfires and tornadoes. Yeah. And yeah. I don't go to wildfires. I have asthma. That would not be a good place mm. to hang out. No. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned that you also did other uh, volunteering um, I locally. Well, um, I volunteer here yep. at the Historical Society. Sure. And I came in after I retired, and they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do primary research. Okay. And they said, okay, what do you want to research? I said, uh, whatever you tell me to research, I don't really have a thing. So um, my first assignment was Ashland Cemetery, mm. and I'm actually doing a tour on Sunday for that. Um, and then the second one was the United States Colored Troops mm -hmm. of Cumberland County. And then somehow I started hanging out at the shop one day a week, <laughs> volunteering over there. Well, is there anything about, I mean, so you grew up in Carlisle, mm -hmm. in Cumberland County. Yeah. Um, Do you come across anything that you didn't previously realize through your volunteering here? Um, well, a lot of history I never knew. Because, I mean, in school, the history is just, well, it's not like local history most of the time. Well, it depends on where you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I've certainly learned a lot about people from Carlisle that, mm -hmm. I mean, they were dead way before I was ever born. Sure. <laughs> and they're buried at Ashland Cemetery now. Or buried in one of the, you know, cemeteries for U.S. Colored Troops. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been interesting. There's, I mean, Carlisle has... A lot of families that have been here like forever. Yeah. <laughs> generation after generation. And then a lot of families that were very famous and very historic and they're just none of them are left. Hmm. So it's sort of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them at Ashland. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um and then I know also you've done a lot with uh animals. I do. I've I work with a group called Furry Friends Network. Mm -hmm. We foster dogs and cats um, until we can find them a forever home. I started doing cats when I was still working. You can kind of leave them and they're okay. Yeah. Uh, didn't do dogs till I retired. Um, I do home visits for them. That's the last step in adopting. We come visit your home and make sure it's safe and that everything on your application was true. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Sure. And then, so is there like a local rescue that they're affiliated with? Well, or? it's just Furry Friends Network, and they okay. they don't have a shelter. All the animals are in foster homes. Okay. Um, and the animals are pulled. Some of them are local owner surrenders. Um, s most of them come from Virginia, Kentucky, where their shelters are ninety nine percent kill. Nobody adopts an animal there. Um, so there are people that go into those shelters and kind of look over the animals, the ones that they seem to think are very adoptable. They'll take pictures, they'll videotape, they'll send it out to their partner rescues all over the Northeast. And then people like me will say, oh, I'll take that one. <laughs> well, again, I'm, I'm sure that must be, you know, a similar experience where, you know, you're... I'm sure you get attached to these Yeah, you do get attached to them. And, I... and some of them are in horrible condition when we mm -hmm. get them. Um, but we kind of get them medical help, get them fixed up, um, find a good forever home. And people say, how can you give them up? I'm like, well, one, I could only have so many dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and two, um, if I don't give this one up, I can't help the next one. Mm -hmm. So if I hadn't given the first couple up, there would be 60 or 70 dogs that might not have made it. Hmm. Um, and the other thing is we're so picky about their forever homes mm -hmm. that you feel really good when you hand them off to their new owner. Mm. <laughs> it's like, oh, great, they'll be fine. <laughs> now, do you still, are you still adopting cats at the same time? I dogs? no longer foster cats. I just do dogs. All right, yeah, yeah. foster. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I, I was told that you were also pretty instrumental in getting the uh, the dog park here in Carlisle. That's true. I was one of the original people that stood out on the street, got signatures, asking borough council to allow us to have a dog park. Um, 
raised money to open it, supervised it before we have, we have an electronic key system, so we know who's in there, but before we had that, one of the members, the board members had to be out there whenever mm -hmm. it was open, so I was out there. and I still do all of the dog park orientations. New member, I meet you out there, give your key fob, explain the rules, answer questions, and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, is it a pretty, not having a dog here in Carlisle, oh. I, I can't say I've been, so is it a pretty popular park? or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the people that join it just love it. Yeah. Because um, it's so good for dogs to just run off leash. Mm -hmm. It really tires them out. And a <laughs> tired dog is a really good dog. <laughs> yeah. And you meet a lot of other dog people, and your dog is socialized. Dogs should really spend some time with other dogs so that they're not, like, scared of them or aggressive towards <laughs> them or whatever, you know. Yep. <laughs> just like you need to spend time with other people. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh... So I used to, before I moved to Carlisle, I lived in Hanover, mm -hmm. and I've just noticed it. I mean, compared to Hanover, Carlisle, there's still a lot more people out walking mm -hmm. dogs, and yeah. exercising. So I, I can only, if I'm not even attending the dog park, I can yeah. imagine how popular that. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's a great place for dogs, it really is. <laughs> sure. Um... Now, does that help, too, with the, the fostering, like, in terms of... Right, yeah, because we allow fosters to come for free if they're okay. from recognized foster, you know, groups, not just if you said, oh, I'm a foster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it really gets them oriented, oriented to other dogs, to other people, mm -hmm. um, a lot of exercise, yeah. Yeah, and I'm guessing you also don't necessarily know the past of the, the dog either, so... No, most times you have no clue. You just have to sort of evaluate as you yep. go. Um, yeah, there are some dogs that really are not dog park dogs, you know, yeah. because of whatever they've been through. Or, and some of them are just sort of lazy slugs who just <laughs> kind of sit. Sure. <laughs> now, do you have sort of, like, permanent... Like family dogs? Oh, we, we do. We have four dogs of our own. Okay. Yeah. So that allows you to kind of see how the, yeah. the foster dogs yeah. are adapting. And I only, because I'm al allowed to talk to where the dogs are coming from and get information, I, of course, only could take a dog that gets along with other dogs or okay. be like a insane asylum. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but my dogs are so used to it, they just... Like, oh, there's another one. <laughs> I try to stick to one foster at a time. Mm. Kind of sometimes it overlaps a little. All right. Yeah. But I just recently, in the last two weeks, had two fosters adopted out. So right now there's no fosters at the house. All right. So you're looking for the, the next one? Right now I'm taking a little bit of a break. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have some trips planned. And sure. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, well, let me ask. How long does it usually take... Um, between the time between the time you, you know, get a dog, mm -hmm. and to it really them. really varies depending on their medical needs. We keep everyone quarantined, well, with our dogs for fourteen days mm -hmm. at the very least, um, depending on what their medical needs are or whatever. I mean, I've had dogs that I got in, and we have people waiting for say that particular mix or breed of dog mm -hmm. and they're already have an approved application so they're like in and out <laughs> it's quick and then I have some that linger for six months maybe mm -hmm. but our commitment is that we will keep them until they're dead I mean until they die a natural death if mm -hmm. if nobody adopts them we're just that committed to and people will complain about our application process and say you don't like people you like dogs we're like yeah. <laughs> That's well, about especially it. probably after all the, the dog has been through. Right. I mean, the, some of those dogs, it's, oh, it's horrible. Mm. And, you know, we want them never to have that again. Yeah. I had two dogs, two separate occasions, where the owners moved in December, tied them in the yard, and just left. Mm. And two other separate occasions where the owners said, somebody didn't take this right now, I'm shooting it. 
So, but most of them are just. I gather in West Virginia and Kentucky, if you don't want your dog, you just leave it on the road somewhere because they just find them, mm. the strays, and they're you know they don't have collars, they don't have tags, so mm-hmm. or chips or anything. Yeah, I'd say, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't grow up. I grew up in Vermont, and so <laughs> my mother was a vet tech, so uh-huh. it's kind of a foreign concept. Yeah, today. it's yeah, and it's every Saturday all year long, there are transports of dogs coming up. From all the way down south, West Virginia, Kentucky, all the way up, all the way up to the northeast. Yep. And they're mostly volunteers transporting for an hour, hour and a half drive, mm-hmm. switch them off to somebody else to get to rescues that will take them. That actually no, it reminds me of another story that's kind of sad now that I mm-hmm. think about it, where we, my wife and I have a cat, and when we moved into our apartment in Hanover, we had to verify that we wouldn't leave this cat behind when we moved out. People do that all the time. And I, my <laughs> wife and I looked at the, our landlord like, what are you talking about? And I, I mentioned, I'm like, my wife would leave me before she leaves that cat behind. Yeah, yeah definitely. But, yeah, it's yeah I mean, some of them are just left when people move. They're just dumped. Mm. I had one that I picked up, and it was a gorgeous English lab. I mean, perfect confirmation. Four years old, and the vet, when I took her in, said she's had 11 or 12 litters of puppies. Wow. Like, really, people? And then she'd had a C-section, which, of course, made her useless, so they just mm-hmm. dumped her. <laughs> mm. Well, so uh, you've been involved a lot with the, the Red Cross and with animals and here at the Historical <laughs> Society. Anything else that you've been up to recently, or...? Since you've I do stuff at church. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Where is that? St. Patrick's. Yeah, that's, that's right. I take, I take communion to a nursing home. Mm-hmm. I help direct the children's choir, and I play guitar and sing with a, the big people choir, as okay. we call it. <laughs> <laughs> Done some over, other things over the years, too, but I think that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. Now, what's the, uh, what's the choir like at St. Pat's? It's fun. We're yeah. sort of, the one I'm in is like more contemporary music, so we have okay. a guy playing drums, a pianist, guitar, we just got another guitarist, a couple play, people playing brass, yeah, we just kind of have a good time. Now, um, you mentioned that you're, that you went to St. Pat's mm-hmm. first through eighth grade. Yeah. Did you also attend St. Pat's as a child, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, and were you involved with, were, I don't know when the move was made to Marsh Drive? No, I was like leaving high school and going off to college when they did that, when they moved out there. So I never really saw that till I came back in 1990. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And was that like a shock to you? Or well, no, I mean, I'd seen the pictures and stuff. Sure. So now. <laughs> I mean, that. Uh, I'm also an archivist there. Mm-hmm. I help with the archives committee. Sure. So, um, you know, we've been through all the archive stuff, organizing it, and it was interesting watching when they were making that decision. I mean, they obviously needed more room, but mm-hmm. on the Pomper Street site, there was no room to be had. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, people were now, like, driving to church as opposed to, I okay. guess, back when they built it walk in there (laughs) so they had no real parking Mm. um so they thought about doing this and they thought about that and then they finally built the whole new church and then um because the people were so devoted to the old building um which is really quite historical it was built in 1892 originally Hmm. burned and then rebuilt partially i mean partially burned and then rebuilt 1923 they agreed that they would keep it open for Ever, for part of the time, any you know, mm-hmm. so, and keep it up, which I'm sure is a huge maintenance expense. At, you know those old buildings. Yeah. When you look around these churches in town, you just think, where do they get the money to keep them up? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Cause I'm kind of, in, I have, I think I have one more interview, mm-hmm. sort of, um, with the Second Presbyterian Congregation, mm-hmm. and it seems like they went through a very similar experience where you know church on oh it's like where the salvation army 
is now. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Pomford and Hanover, and yeah. then realized we have no more room, and then they moved. And to, it's too expensive to even fix. Yeah. So they moved so, to the outskirts yeah. of town because they wanted parking yeah. and all you know places yeah. for kids to run around and all that well, stuff. Well, now the Methodist Church, I mean the three Methodist churches combined into mm -hmm. one, but they're building now. They'll be selling that because. You know, there's not parking. I mean, there's some parking, but not yeah. nearly enough, and they need more room, and mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's interesting. All these places coming to similar decisions yeah. over the years. Now, um, well, I, I'm just thinking back to some of the questions I mm -hmm. had for the Second Presbyterian group, but I'm guessing the Catholic Church is a little bit different because. You don't vote on things, and oh no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not a democracy. <laughs> but uh, were there um, so you said you moved back in nineteen ninety? Yeah. So you would have had uh, Reverend Fontanella. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, what, what was what was he like as? He was the, wonderful. Yeah. He, he was there twenty seven years till he retired. Ah. And he came in, when he came in, it was a disaster. Was it? Financially, there was not a penny to pay the staff the next day. Mm. Um, a total disaster. And um, he got the place up and going and running and active. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Pretty cool guy. He, yeah. he was very good. He, his hiring practice was, I hire good people. I pay them a good salary, well, as much as the church can pay, mm -hmm. and then I leave them alone to do what they do best. Mm -hmm. He didn't, like, micromanage and complain. And, and if people came and complained about something, he's like, no, I'm not listening to it. <laughs> now, you know, I have to excuse my ignorance, but did he, was he also in charge of the school, or was that separate? Yeah, well, it is under him, but a principal would be hired to, okay. to run the school. And the school has a separate school board from the parish council okay. I think they call it yeah hmm. so yeah so ultimately he is but he's not involved they wouldn't be involved in the day-to-day -day yeah. efforts of okay. it all yeah well I, I didn't know if some of that financial you know bled over to the school and he oversaw well I mean and that was probably it. most of the staff at whenever 27 years ago before he retired was mm -hmm. um, that was probably most of the staff the school mm-hmm I mean, they have a lot more staff now than they used to, but they have a lot more physical plant to deal yeah. with. Yeah. So, uh, what was what was he like, sort of in the, the pulpit, in terms of the, the sermons? He was very good, excellent. Yeah. yeah, very kind of down to earth, very honest. Um, he knew every single person's name uh -huh. in that church, and when you go up to communion, he'd say. You know, Lisa, the body of Christ. Yeah. I, I don't know how he knew all those people. Because there's, I mean, it's pretty big. Yeah. Obviously, if they were new, he had to figure it out later. But, yeah. No, he was, he was an interesting guy. He really was. Yeah. He did a good job out there for 27 years. And he, when um, he retired, um, he had a house in Crisfield, Maryland that he had had for years. Mm -hmm. And, um was mostly there, but would come back for people's funerals that he knew. And he said, when I die, I want to be in the old cemetery. <laughs> I don't know if you know Steve Mellon. He's the buildings and grounds guy. No. But he's like, there is no more room in the old cemetery behind the old church. It's, yeah. I mean, it's been there since 1751. It's full. He said, well, you can put me between the church and the rector. He said, we can't get a backhoe in there. He said, you can find some people to dig a hole there. <laughs> and that's where he is. <laughs> he insisted he was going to be there. Yeah. And they, they found some people to dig a hole. Well, somehow they dug the hole. I don't know. <laughs> wasn't part of that. Yeah. I think I was working then. <laughs> no, and so, again, I mean, one of the differences between the Presbyterian Church mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church is, you know, he, I'm getting, he wasn't chosen by the parish. Oh, no, no. Yeah. He sent, they're sent by the bishop. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so you kind of get who you get. Yeah. 
But um, for 27 years. Yeah, it, it was fine. Out. Yeah. It worked out very well. It worked out very well. I mean, there probably were people that didn't care for him, I guess. Sure. But that's everywhere. No, it, it's interesting. We, like, have no. They just. Now, it used to be they really had no choice either. But now they're given a little more leeway there. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll say, these are the openings. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they can at least say, I want X. Uh, not that they necessarily get it, but mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, you really need to match. Well, in any church, the pastor with the yeah. congregation. I mean, and not everyone can run a parish like St. Patrick's, which is huge, as opposed to some teeny little place in the middle of nowhere. It's it's a whole different set of skills, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would imagine. And so. I think Carlisle, I mean, overall has a a very well educated populace. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different preaching to a well-educated crowd as opposed to, you know, maybe somewhere in the boonie zone nowhere where not so much. How, how big is the, the parish then? You know, I'm not sure. I would say probably over 2,000 families. Mm. I'm not sure that all of them are active, you know, yeah. but I would... A good many. The church... I think the Marsh Drive Church holds a little over 800 people. Okay. Um, so, and it's pretty full all the time. Yeah, and there are multiple services. Yeah, and multiple services, and it's always pretty full. Well, one of the things I always like to ask is, is there anything I should have asked or um, brought brought up or mentioned or anything you would like to mention before we, before we stop? No, I just... I think Carlisle's a cool place. Yeah. Um, I like living here. It's it's close to a lot of other stuff. If you want to go to a city, you can do it. Um, and I'm quite a hiker, so a lot of hiking availability around mm. here. So it's a nice place to raise a family yeah. and grow up. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much okay. for uh, talking to me. Sure. Today.